Um, my brief from Daniel <clears throat> was to keep it personal, <laughs> so no PowerPoint. So there's going to be two films that I'd like to show as the conversation progresses, but really I didn't want to do death by PowerPoint. We're storytellers, and we think that film is one of the best ways of telling a story. <clears throat> you can add emotion, you can add depth, you can add feeling, and it's better than just mere words alone. So I hope you'll agree that when I show them, they hit them on. And lastly, uh, I think this is normal, but I just wanted to say we'll keep today largely in English because I promise you my English is much better than my Swiss German. <laughs> so <coughs> forgive me for that one, and I hope that's okay, but I'm sure there's enough German and Swiss German speakers in the room that if anybody wants to express themselves or ask a question, it can easily be translated and, and, and we'll all get on. So into the bonus of it. <clears throat> I think I'm a very lucky man, not just living here in Zurich, which I think is also brilliant, but I seem to have found myself in very interesting places at very interesting times throughout my career. And each of them has been in some way connected with brand. So as you know, what we're talking about is the idea of brand debt. And that's a pretty firework kind of question when we talked about this a little while ago. <clears throat> Brands are clearly not debt, otherwise we wouldn't have a business. But I think the way that you think about a brand and the way that you build a brand <coughs> has reached a tipping point. And the old way of doing it is dead, and we have to find a new way. And that's really going to be how I approach this subject. But back to me. <coughs> I started my career in the late 80s in London, and I worked in advertising. And that was a pretty amazing time to be in advertising back then, because it was really and you never know it at the time, you just know it when you look back. It was great talent, making fantastically big ideas, with enormous budgets. I mean, God, when I think now, the kind of money that clients used to say, we can make a TV commercial and we've got 500 or 700,000 pounds, which is probably, what, nearly a million Swiss francs. Back then, to make one film, <coughs> it was amazing. And we had, in the agency I worked for, we had Ridley and Tony Scott used to make our TV commercials for us, before they went to Hollywood. And you kind of open the meeting room door, you walk in and be like, hi, oh, yeah, can you get me a coffee? I'm Tony. And it's all sort of like, this was just normal, everyday stuff. It was all around traditional media, so it was all about TV, it was about press, it was about radio, it was about posters. It wasn't really about anything else, there wasn't anything else. That was how you expressed yourself as a company, as a product, as a brand. And I then thought, well, hang on a minute, if I knew then what I knew now, how much did we really pay attention to the brands that we were working with? And it actually came down to one thing. We had creative briefs. Saatchi and Saatchi, box at the bottom, constraints and mandatories. And that bit always had a, a, one line that said, brand guidelines must be adhered to. <laughs> seen the very same thing on your books, and if there's any clients here, I'm sure you write that on your books as well. <laughs> but now the honest admission of truth and guilt, we sometimes didn't even have brand guidelines for that client in the agency. So we'd present an idea, <coughs> and we would say, what do you think? And the client would say, I love it. And then the only debate you ever really had was, is my logo big enough? I seem to remember having that conversation with my <laughs> And they always wanted it bigger, and we always wanted to make it smaller because it was encroaching on the creative idea. And there wasn't much more conversation about brand and about qualities and about brand interaction than that. And I think it's almost shocking, but I just wanted to remember how that was. Anyway, it lasted about 10 years of advertising before it all got too much. It was just too much excitement. And um, then I moved on in the 90s and I became a client. And again, right place, right time. Very lucky kind of opportunity came my way to join an American-funded 
telecoms company that had landed in the UK and wanted to establish themselves with a ton of money. <coughs> and that always helped. A lot of money behind you. And that company employed the latest technology at that time. It's all about fiber optic, fiber optic cable technology. So I found myself over about six years being given the brilliant task of launching something called digital interactive television, which was the first time that you could actually talk back and the red thing that comes up in the corner of your screen, two-way path. I mean, <coughs> it was revolutionary at the time, amazing. And then the next thing that came along was pay-per-view movies. So you could go somewhere and buy content in little chunks, pay for it, and have it when you want, when you want. Again, pretty revolutionary at the time. And I remember also working on one project that was always a deadly secret, but it was very much about the home of the future. And one of the biggest things that I remember thinking about, talking about, was your television set could be used like a computer, and your computer could be used like a television set. <laughs> Again, whoa, unbelievable. Who would ever think it was? And then the biggest and best thing that we launched was something called broadband internet. I mean, really, I'm that old. Um, <laughs> and the big debate was, would people really pay extra to get fast download speeds? I mean, all of these questions that we struggled with were just, you know, I think about them now, like, God, the world has changed so much. It was a tipping point. You just don't really see it with clarity at the time, but how fantastic to have been a part of it. And during that period, when I was a client, brand became much more important to me. And not least because one of the other things I did when I was there was <coughs> someone called me into a room and said, right, we are six separate companies. We went on a huge acquisition trail and we bought this company and that company and this company and that company, a production company and a content company and a delivery company. Okay, now we've got them all. We have to pull them all together into one brand. And you're the person that's going to go and do it. <laughs> okay, never done that before. Gosh, I wonder how you do it. Um, and I realized that going through that process, it was about creating order out of chaos. How do you pull six different separate entities together? And then as I was thinking about this talk and really thinking about, yeah, but okay, it was order out of chaos and it was a brand and it was all very exciting. How did we really approach it? What was the mindset of the time? And it was about, and I honestly think this, and I hope it provokes sharp and takes a breath. It was really about the visual. I mean, we did, spend some time on trying to define what the values of the company were and what the organization mission statement should be and things like that. But really the emphasis was not terribly much on that. And then when we went into the creative phase, which seemed to be almost 10 minutes later as far as I can remember, <laughs> it was very much all about the visual. And we cared far more about what it all looked like. And the two things didn't necessarily tie up together very closely. <clears throat> Probably says more about me and my team, actually. But anyway, it was, I'm being very honest with you, because that's the, the point of today. And, and I sort of turned into logo cop over the space of about six or seven months. And I had this enormously rigorous set of guidelines, colors, typefaces, grids, all of that stuff. It was all done, best practice for, for, its, for its moment in time. And I just had to kind of march around an organization saying, you can't do it like that, and you can't do it like that, and you've got to move your logo down there, and you can't possibly use that color because it's not in the palette. But really, it all came down to the brand I talked about was only about colors and positions and sizes. It wasn't much more than that. And at the time, that was, that was fine. But the products that we were launching were actually going to change the world. I didn't realize it, as I said. but. Beyond that period of time, everything's changed and it will never go back to how it used to be. So I've got a couple of questions to ask you. Who here is carrying a smartphone? <laughs> <laughs> Who here has an iPad or a tablet? <laughs> Who here still has a laptop that they carry around with them? More than I think. <laughs> <laughs> and last, I want you to be honest. 
who's looked at their smartphone since we started this session? <laughs> I promise you, if I was sitting there, I'd probably be looking at it right now, so whatever. Um, I think the way that we consume our world, the way we interact with brands, and each other, is totally different to only five years ago or six years ago. And again, we're living in this moment, and I don't think we necessarily appreciate how different it is, but just take a moment to stop and think back and realize how your life has changed, how your habits have changed, how you are addicted to your smartphones. Um, I'd like to play a movie here because we've sort of tried to make this point time and time again to clients and to anyone who will listen, actually, anywhere around the world. And we call this new world that we're living in the moving world. Technical team. <laughs> this um, was your. <laughs> good, good. Right. Um, the moving world. The film which captures it up to the minute in the best possible way is our showreel. So we're not really showing this to sell ourselves, Daniel. I don't know what to do this. However, we are going to show it because it shows the expression, the breadth of expression that that is now possible and is now required in the moving world. The established branding and advertising silos are no longer relevant. In a fast moving world, a business has to change and adapt, and so must its brand. We're striving to set a new benchmark in creativity and its power to transform business. Our approach is unique. We connect people to brands and brands to people and we've proven it with some of the best companies in the world. really was just to show the breadth of the deliverables, the breadth of the experiences, the breadth of the creativity that you need to have in a moving world. <clears throat> and it's this moving world, I think, that creates our most exciting opportunity. <coughs> but we also have to remember that it is killing established solutions. Um, and they have prevailed for a very long time. And I think they do live on in the minds of some people. I would imagine very few people in this room have, do not appreciate the moving world. I would hope that very few people in this room do not appreciate the moving world. But again, as I was pulling together the bones of this talk, I suddenly thought back to some of the most recent conversations that I've had with 
clients and potential clients. None of the clients in this room, I hasten to add. Um, whereby people have said, they've come at it from what I would call the old school way, and they've said, well, you know, it's about a logo, we need a new logo. We've got this new thing and we really need a new logo, and um, you've got to do all those other things you do, like typography and colors and grids and stuff. And it's like, when's the conversation gonna go into and all the other things that you need in today's world. And actually, they don't come into the conversation. So truly, there are people out there who have control over budgets and have control over the shape of things to come who haven't yet worked that world into the way that they're talking and the way that they're thinking. And I don't honestly know, and you might have a, a different view, I don't know whether that's because they're scared of it. I don't know that's because they, are, they don't really get it. Or just that they were going to have that conversation a bit later down the line, but they just wanted to see if we were any good on that. So I have no idea. But it's interesting. It's still there are still notions out there that have not gone away just yet. Very scary, I think. What what would our what's our response to to this? Our being this room and creative people like us, not necessarily moving brands. I think the challenge, and Ben actually says it, Ben is our CEO founder and, and long-time colleague, um, when he makes the point that the challenge we all face hasn't changed, we still basically have to connect people to brands and brands to people. But we just have lots more ways to do it. And the more we have, the more complex our task has become as creatives and we have much more to manage and much more to think about. But we also have an enormous playing field to get excited about, and an enormous playing field to get on and run around them. But I also thought, what would the kind of tenets be of this moving world? What are the, what's the main premise? And <clears throat> when I think back to how it was when I created the, the telecoms brand, it was all about push. I think I was, we were a team of thousand people who were pushing a message, pushing a brand out onto the world. And I think the moving world means you don't push brands out anymore. You launch them out, and then they live. And it's not so much about the control that you can have. You have to learn how to be comfortable with a lot less control of your brand. You still have to know where it's going and what it wants to do, but you can't necessarily control it in the way that you used to be able to when it was all about paid media. I think Logo Cop is retiring, if he hasn't retired already. And I think that the old ways of approaching the brand and the old ways of thinking are not enough. I could not bring that telecoms brand to life in the same way that I did, I think it was 12 years ago, 13 years ago, 12 years ago, something like that. Because I didn't have enough understanding of who we were as an organization. And because I didn't have enough understanding, I didn't brief an agency to create enough assets to allow me to express myself in a very rounded, rich, and emotive way. And that was fine for then, but it isn't fine for now. So what's next? I mean, clearly, <coughs> put out there that the world has changed, what do we have to do about it? And I, I sort of thought the only real way, I don't want to lecture you, I don't want to teach, that would be horribly arrogant. I just wanted to share some of our experiences. And I wanted just to say how we've done it. It's not the only way, and I'm sure you have your own ways of approaching these challenges and, and, and this world too. But if we all share and we all collaborate, maybe we can all get there a bit quicker and do it a bit better. And I hope that when we get into the open discussion afterwards, you will be as open as, as we can be as well, because it's great to share. We think it starts with a story. Now, when I did my brand 12 years ago, 13 years ago, and it wasn't the only one I did, but it's the one I want to talk about, um, it had a mission statement, and it was live life in broadband. It was that short. There was nothing more to it than that. We thought it was amazing. <laughs> short, snappy, everybody remember it. Walk around, say, what's the mission statement? <laughs> but if you think that the moving world gives you so much potential, it's a world full of emotion, it's a world full of expression, movement, sound, um, and actually a lot of uncontrolled conversation in the social networks. Once your brand is out there, it gets talked about, and you can't really do very much about it, much though you'd like to. 
Um, surely that calls for a richer capture of the intent and the vision. I hope you know what I mean by that. But I mean, I think you really have to spend a lot longer thinking about who you are and what you want to be and where you're going. And then you have to really paint the best possible picture of that. And that calls for a story in our mind. That's the best way we found of capturing it. So to create a story. And that story is much more than just live life and broadband. It tends to be long. It could be half a page. It could be nearly a whole page long. Now, that's quite a body of work to get from nothing to putting that much thought and that much considered and crafted expression down on a piece of paper. But it is amazing because it engages the mind. Once you've got that story, it becomes much easier to talk about who you are and where you're going and what you're doing. Not only amongst yourselves as a creative community, but also to employees. So if you've got a large organisation, you have to get them facing the same way. You have to get them following you. You have to get them going where you want them to. And actually, a story is a great way of doing that, to capture the hearts and minds. It's a great way of making sure that your partners, because it's a very complex and matrix world that we all live in now, and nobody does it on their own. So a story is a great way of explaining quickly, succinctly, and exactly how you want to, where you're going, to your partners. And of course, that then plays out to customers and potential customers as well. It tells them what they need to understand, and actually, I think that provides the basis of consistency today. So where I was doing it with, like, it has to be Pantone reference X, Y, Z, and the logo's got to be here, and the exclusion zone's that big. It didn't really very much about that anymore. It's much more about consistency of story, consistency of understanding. But a story on its own is not enough. I mean, we wouldn't be designers having this conversation if it was all about words. To be distinctive in our world of noise and competition, because there's also a lot of other things going on, as we well know, in the moving world, um, we need to be clearly defined as well. And the character and the behaviours of a brand need to be created at the same time as the story. And it's not really about four single word values anymore. Again, I was thinking about this, I was kind of cringing and thinking, God, yeah, we had those four values back then, didn't we? We were powerful and we were innovative. And I'm sure you've all struggled with, what the hell does passionate mean when I'm trying to do crack this brief? Or how do I make something innovative? I mean, they're all great concepts, but actually it's not enough to drive you to a succinct expression. So the way that we do it is we go beyond single values and we create traits, behaviours, and a personality for a brand. And that really helps us when we want to start going beyond and creating applications. It really gives you a confidence to say, this is how we want to bring this animation to life. It really starts feeding the real world in a great way. It's also tough to do this at the beginning. There's a great sense in you have to train yourself to be thinking ahead and thinking together. So as the brand comes to life in multiple forms, you have to really be thinking about all the applications that you know you're going to have to make further down the line at the time you're defining the character. It's a new way of thinking. It's this multi-dimensional thinking. And really, I just wanted to bring Matt and Hannah alive a moment. You saw a little touch of, of HP up there. You may know that we worked on a three-year, two-and-a-half year? Time to think about it. A long time <laughs> brand transformation in California on H. Hewlett Packard. Now, that is a global brand present everywhere in every form you could possibly think. And the job that Matt and Hannah did in thinking about that brand, conceiving that brand, multi-dimensionally and holding it in their head at a kind of conceptual stage, is no mean feat. So, I mean, please talk to them later about how it is to have to think in a much broader and much more multi-dimensional way at the beginning. And to do that, we have to have a very different looking team. So we found that you really have to have the right skills to think multi-dimensionally, multi-media, whatever the right words are, probably not finding them. Um, so your teams have to be much broader than they used to be. I remember engaging a team of graphic designers. That's how I got my brand. I wouldn't do that today. I'd mix up on-screen designers, I'd mix up web designers, we'd have strategists in the mix. It's all about much broader teams with different skills coming together, working together to create the end result. 
And the other thing that we really learned is not only is it about sharing thought and hearing voices in the team, but actually it's super important to involve clients along the way. Now, <laughs> I've, got, I've got some here actually, and I wasn't expecting it really, but it's just amazing that some clients are here. It's, it's imperative that you go on a journey together because it's fantastic and rich and not ever to be missed to get clients to help you with your thinking. And it's something that I think people often fight, but we've learned not to fight it. Bring your clients in, take them on the journey. Because, and I hope that you would agree, that if it is an amazing journey that you go on, and at the end of it, if you have gone on it together, and it hasn't been adversarial, as it can be in some times, or it isn't doctor and patient, which is another kind of relationship that we've seen, doesn't necessarily work, then going on it together, sharing the highs and lows, getting input, including the client perspective in the conversation is absolutely hugely important. And at the end of the day, you all come out of the process as advocates. It's, it's powerful magic, really. And the other thing, just a couple more points. The toolbox that you have to make and the toolbox you have to think about is actually, be, is actually going to be much bigger than you think. It's going to be really jam-packed full of stuff that you have to make. It's a very rich and testing process to go through to make a multi-sensor in your brain. But again, you have to give yourself the assets and the tools you need to live in a moving world. And you can't do that if you don't make the assets. And I think you get the sense that none of this happens very quickly. Because that's absolutely true. Something that Daniel, Jeanette and I were discussing when we were talking about this talk was, um, and it comes up time and time again with clients who often come to the table and say, you know, I need a new brand. And I promised the CEO, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, absolute tops, otherwise I'm dead. And it doesn't take that short of time to do it. It's a much longer process. And you have to let yourself go through the stages of the process. And you have to let yourself think and define properly. And that takes a lot longer than perhaps you would imagine it would when you're trying to build a project plan before you start creating. Because if you get the definition right, the creative comes out much quicker. And then you've got a huge job to do to make the breadth of assets that you absolutely have to to live in the moving world. <clears throat> well, I'm conscious that my role here was to stimulate the conversation. And there have been as many books written about brand as we could fill this room with. So I probably only touched on the surface. I probably skated across some things. But that was intentional because you can't do it in 20 minutes. But there is some proof that this brand magic of which we're talking can actually work. And so I want to end by showing a film. The film of the Swiss Con journey, which I hope as creatives we all see and recognize from our daily lives. And it's just, it was our experience that we documented on film. I just wanted to show this film to you now to say, this is how it really works.
of Swisscom, it's problem of SBB, it's problem of Apple. Whatever brand I saw, it's a problem. They don't, the people on the counter in the shop don't behave as the brand suggests. Maybe I am wrong. Maybe it's the brand that is wrong because people can't follow. So what's your opinion? You don't care because it's not your job? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no, you make a very good point, and I think, again, it's, a, it's, it's an experience that, that we've had, that when organizations are large, <clears throat> this, is probably, this, is, this is really a fundamental point about branding, because a brand should be about everything you do and everything you say, and it should come from the top, and it should be, it should be, in, it should be part of everything that happens. So if there's a process created, the process should be in service of the brand. If there's a sales behavior, or I can't think of another word for it, but that would do, there's a sales behavior, that should be in sympathy with the brand. Because that's, that's the rule book, that's the best practice way of doing it. But just think in the rule world, in a real world, about how siloed organizations actually tend to be. Despite the best intentions in the world, is there a strong enough alliance between the various departments in very large organizations? And I would say that in our experience, it's not that strong. And it gets down to human relationships because business is about human relationships. And actually, <coughs> It then becomes the job, I mean CEOs, I actually had this conversation earlier, CEOs can smash their hands on the table and say, just do it. And most of the time, people do just do it. But there's also times when someone goes, well, I don't want to do it like that. And they actually can do it their own way, because they're in charge. They're running a business division. They're running something. And they're measured against numbers for doing it. And if they don't believe, that they are going to follow the new way, then sometimes they're allowed to go off course. And it's an imperfect world that we live in, to be honest. And I think that everybody understands it would be great if we all sang the same song. But actually, you find in reality that it's not that simple to, to get everybody to sing the song. It's an ongoing, pretty much endless and thankless task for the person who's in charge of the brand to keep hammering home that message to say, there's a flaw in the system, the system needs to change to be more like this. And then it becomes about <clears throat> who has the most power, who has the most influence, whether you've met somebody on a good day or a bad day. I mean, really, it, it, it doesn't, it isn't all as joined up as it could be, but there's a very academic way of looking at it, which I think we would all do, and we are as professionals on a bound to always promote the fact that things should be linked and things should work in a very cohesive and joined up way. But I take your point and I think you see in the real world that it doesn't always doesn't always happen. But as long as there are people who know it's not happening and people who care about it not happening, then there's a chance. That's where the story actually comes to become very important because the story <coughs> captures where the company, the organization, brand needs to and wants to go. And then you go on a journey with people. I mean, you would never really, I think, thank you, Ashley, you'd never really create a brand for today because why would you go through all that effort and spend all that money if it's just going to sit relevantly in today's world? You surely want to use the energy of a rebrand or the creation of something to put you into a new place. And it's bloody good at doing that, actually. It's a really great way of moving from A to B, from going from the as-is state of today to the to-be state of some point in the future. And you have to take yourself to the to-be state, imagine what that looks like, and imagine the implication of it, and then plot a journey between today and there, if you can. And then it's about education, it's about change, it's about processes, it's about all the things that come in and follow that journey. In other words, you never have to fulfill your promises. 
because you never live in reality with your brand. You always live step ahead. No, 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 so you no, 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 I, I, no, I disagree. You have a place that you are aiming for, and that place has to be different from today. And you, well, you are in the service of getting from here to there, and you are changing things to get to that point. That's really what it's about. So, yeah, it doesn't look like it today, because you still have things left to change. But you should be aiming for there. And the trick, I think, if there is a trick, the trick is to keep that point fixed, and to still go for it, and believe in it, and to aim for there. But that gets tricky. But you'll never get there, right? So, because you're... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> insisting. Because, you, because, because that point is going to move as you're on the journey, right? Yeah. Thank God it's changing. And you're yeah. complex as Thank well. God. It needs to be. Dead. Oh, okay. <laughs> it has to move. The gap keeps growing, the world changes. Mm. Yeah, then you move <coughs> again ahead of it. Yeah. yeah. But then you're you striving for that. But point. you know yourself better, so you know your brand. So you, you then react to the change and you react to the I mean, iPhone smartphones, mm. the world's changed in four years or five years. Mm -hmm. But with a greater understanding of yourself, you can then deal with that change in a different way. It gets a bit conceptual, but it is something to say, well, you know, this is how we are, and this is how we have to deal with this challenge, or this way to go. I, I had an opportunity to work with Wally only in Team 3 in a brand, um, and uh, basically one of the things that he was doing is he was building it for the future. And he was thinking in that way. He was thinking, okay, this is this is this is going to look good still in five, ten years. And then some of these questions came at the time. He's like, but what what are we going to do then? And he simply said, we're going to reinvent it. We're going to keep evolving. So uh, the work was. I mean, we we reviewed the brand one year later, and we started to review the brand again. So it was always a continuous process. Mm -hmm. So it's I don't know. It just goes like that. But I, I wanted to say, I wanted to ask something. So I think then the traditional relationship in between a company's marketing department and uh, a creative agency is possibly one of the most lethal combinations because... It's one of the most interesting relationships. <laughs> 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 it's a very chart. It's a very British answer. It's a very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they never have the answers, and they don't control the whole psyche of the entire organization. No. The organization wants to go somewhere else. Nobody likes marketing, by the way. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, the interesting thing is not to talk to the marketing. Yeah. Because actually, it, yeah, it's not just about marketing, uh, it's, a, it's a small part of it. So mm -hmm. it's actually a lot more. So if you want to involve, you can't just talk to them. Uh, but that's that's in most heads. So that's where the branding is done, is in the marketing, of course. But it's not there. Example Swisscom. You could do very nice logos if the if the one in the shop behaves in the wrong way. Uh, that doesn't help. So I, I, I was adjusting my message. Maybe not the guy in the shop is behaving the wrong way, but top management. But, <laughs> if I may, uh, throw a hand going up there, please. Are you, you think you're, you're done? Yeah. Okay, good, please. Um, just to address a couple of comments, because this is a really interesting thread to follow. I think it's, it's, it's an easy mistake to characterize the marketing folks as the adversary. And I think it's really important for all of us to just acknowledge the reality of marketing and um, realize that they are among the most important allies. And you're talking about building a story, and you're talking about becoming advocates. And in fact, when we leave, because we will leave at some point, maybe we become the angels, or we float around in the ether somewhere, um, the story becomes the clients. They need to become its owners and its curators long after we're gone. So I think that's just a reality that we need to all acknowledge. I think the model that you're talking about is something that's a lot more dynamic and organic, all right, than past models where we build something really, really gorgeous and pristine and then we hand it off, right? Or, you know, people like myself, or, uh, I'm a child of the dot-com boom in San Francisco where um, I worked for a, a firm called Studio Archetype, which became sapient and big, 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 and clients would come to us with big sacks of money 
and say, just, just do it. Make it fabulous. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really want to know what you're doing, but just, just make it so. And, and we would make it so. And then we go and look at it three weeks, six months, five months later. The cycles were um, more rapid, I think. Uh, there was a correlation between how rapid the cycles were and the availability of the money. So, you know, we would do something and then uh, somebody in the studio would say, hey, you got to look at Xerox.com. Like, whoa, whoa, yeah, we just launched that a few months ago. Yeah, well, I think they hired Razorfish and they just redesigned the site. And like, really? And so I think this idea of sort of the, that line between the agency, you know, uh, this idea of partnership, this idea of this sort of organic interactive thing is, is really the, the model. Mm. that you're seeing now, I think that you're nudging your clients in practice to embrace, am I correct? I mean, I'd love to hear Sasha's mm. voice. I thought, I thought your question, Daniel, was really interesting. Because actually, I mean, to be a little bit bold too, it went, it in, implicates uh, like a, a picture, an ideal of, okay, this is how the brand is defined and this is how the organization has to be. And then you come to a point where it's about, okay, how do you make the brand felt towards the customer or towards any stakeholder? And then you come to the point like, you know, okay, it's about culture. So, okay, now go, go and try it and say, okay, how do you find culture? Now you can do the same exercise, okay, what's the Swiss culture? How do you tell people who come here who want to become Swiss or stay? Okay, now you have to be Swiss and now do this and this. You have to know the seven. And then it's the other thing is about this how you do it. I think every one of us has seen or read how Apple does it to make their people sort of behave the right way. And and you can ask yourself, well would that be the right way or the acceptable way to do it for a company like here in Switzerland? I'm not so sure. So that's I think that's sort of the bigger discussion to it. And then to the other things that have been said, I think that the really main and big challenge is not us in here having that understanding that Jess just, just showed, because I think we're probably more or less with sort of like interesting discussions and different positions on that page. But the real problem is that the people in the organization who decide and who have the big budgets, they are probably at the state which Jeff described in the 80s, or, you know, it's sort of like, you know, they see, yourself, <laughs> they see yourself like, oh, those are the guys who say how big the logo is. Which then also implies that they will not understand at all why you should have to be in certain discussions which are not about the size of the logo. And that's a real, so I think, you know, to, to go on, I think it's, the real interesting um, um, thing would be how can you explain this to people who are not so deep in the topic as, as this group here? And who are not interested in problems. And who, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's also interesting that we are talking a lot about logos and not about branding. But this is a complete other discussion. Please. I think uh, what happens in large corporations is that large corporation doesn't know who they are. They can't characterize themselves. So there's too many individuals within who seek power, who seek, have an opinion. <clears throat> and as an outside consultant, you have an opinion of who they are. So you have basically the user experience. Somebody comes in a store and buys a service or a product, and they expect a corporation to be an entity, a person, you know, and there's a personality. And so we as designers define this personality as branders design these personalities of these companies, but it's it's as if you go to a corporation and you tell 20,000 employees, like, okay, you are now this person, and everybody who comes to talk to you, you pretend to be that person, and you sell this service or this product in that fashion. So that's, I think, where the difficulty comes in also, where you, you have to not only define who this entity is, who this corporation is, and, and show it to customers. You also have to set it within that, that company or corporation, and you have to convince people that, you know what, you wear this t-shirt that has the name on it, and you say this when you greet somebody, and you know this is who we are and how we behave. 
Can I bring Hannah into this conversation? Because I think mean, with her experience, um, with Matt's experience of, of the world's, is it the largest corporation? Not anymore. Not anymore. I'm sorry, I'm terribly, 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 terribly. It never happened. It's four minutes past ten. We are way out of our time, Richard. I'm terrible. Completely got lost of. Can I leave with one comment? Absolutely. Perfect. And then we have to. That's Please. fine. So, uh, I, I think what, what is actually really interesting about this conversation here is that I think we're probably speaking a wrong language. We're trying, we're basically claiming that top leadership doesn't understand brand. But they, when they first set up the business, every business, we all agree that startups are the most exciting era of any business. You know why? Because they have the single-minded idea of what they are about to do, what they are about to change, what they are about, what purpose they will bring to the world and how they are going to go there. And I can ensure that if we are talking about the language of how do we align people together, how do we have purpose, how do we achieve our goals together, top leadership, that's what their agenda is. So who's the guy who's going to be responsible for that? The CEO of the company. Their job is to bring everybody together. So if we can't make that important for them, then we're just speaking some language that he doesn't understand and we are not having a proper conversation together. And that, I think, is the main thing. It's like, this brand is branding dead? Is business dead? Brand's dead if business dead. But if we can't bring those two things together, it's just bringing everything, every single part of it, the product, the people, the organization, the way we talk, the way, the way we speak, the way we behave it, um, each other and to, with our customers together. And that surely is on the agenda of top leadership. <laughs>